Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you're there, say yes. yes, beginning with verse 23. The Bible says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, in labors more than abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, or in other words, in the, in the open waters. How many of you want to serve the Lord right now? <laughs> in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. Or by weaknesses, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knows that I lie not. In Damascus, the governor upon Aretius, the king, kept the city of Damascus with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. Verse 33, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall, and I escaped his hands. The Apostle Paul was letting you and I know he's been through a few things in life. Is there anybody in this room that could testify if I gave you the microphone? I've been through a few things in this life. But Paul was reminding you and I to be faithful, to don't quit. Turn to that neighbor next to you and tell him, don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. We serve a God who is faithful. And you've got to stay in the game. Somebody holler that. Stay in the game. Turn to that other neighbor on the other side of you. They need to hear it. Stay in the game. <laughs> Father, speak to us by the Holy Spirit today. These people don't need to hear from, G uh, from, from me, Lord. They need to hear from you, Jesus. And so today, God, would you speak to us? May the anointing of the Holy Ghost, just as Pastor Wright prayed earlier, Lord, speak to every one of us in this room. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. amen and amen. You may be seated. Tell that person next to you, I'm glad we're sitting in the good-looking section today. I promise you this has something to do with the message. But I want to stop and just thank the Lord that my Atlanta Braves won the World Series this year. <laughs> Pastor, are you sure that has something to do with the message? Just give me a moment. I was uh, watching the game, game one of the World Series. We were excited. The Braves were in the World Series. And... In the second inning, we had our biggest pitcher, our best pitcher, Charlie Morton, our most experienced postseason pitcher, pitching game one of the World Series. We didn't know it at the time, but there was, he pitched a 96 mile per hour ball over the plate that the opposing hitter slammed and hit 102 miles an hour back to the pitcher. It hit his leg, bounced off his leg to an infielder perfectly, and they threw out the batter. Charlie Morton kind of hobbled for a moment, but gathered himself, as you could imagine. I've been a pitcher on the softball field. I know what it's like to get a, a ball hit right back at you fast and actually get hit by uh, the, the uh, bat, uh, by the ball. But this was 102 miles an hour. After he gathered his composure and regained himself, he went back to the mound and he threw 
pitches and got the next three batters out. After the third batter was out, he was obviously grimacing in pain. The trainer and the Atlanta manager came out to the mound and they took the pitcher out of the game. And later we found out that Charlie Morton actually broke his leg on that 102 mile per hour hit back to him. He stayed out there with a broke leg and got the next three batters out before that broke leg moved just enough to where it was impossible for him to continue in the game. Afterwards, when after they had uh, after the game, the Braves won Game One, and in the postseason uh, press, uh, the, the presser rather the the press conference after the game, they asked Charlie. They said, "Charlie, what were your thoughts?" And this was his thought: "I apologize to my teammates. I'm sorry for my injury." You talk about a gamer. Charlie Morton wasn't willing by whatever power he had to be taken out of that game. He wanted to stay in the game. He was definitely what we call a gamer. Apologetic for his own in injury. Everything in him <coughs> wanted him to stay in that game. And I think about that when I'm preaching this message here this morning because I've lived long enough and most of you have lived long enough to where the option comes quite frequently in our life to give up, to throw in the towel, to quit, to exit the game because of one thing or another. The Apostle Paul here in chapter 11 gives us a long liturgy of all of the reasons why he could have gave up. I won't read them again, but you could reread them and just know in every situation, he was detailed enough to give us circumstances surrounding his ailments and surrounding his struggles, and yet he did not give up. He may have felt like giving up, but he didn't give up. I remember what Pastor Tommy Barnett, the pastor of the great First Assembly of God in Phoenix, Arizona, would say, and that is this. He said, you can give up, you can quit as much as you want to, as long as you don't quit. You can feel like quitting, you can be hurt, you can be irritated, you can be wounded, and yet at the end of the day, you can feel like quitting as long as you don't quit. Someone asked me one time, they said, Pastor Bailey, they said, have you ever felt like giving in or quitting or throwing in the towel? More times than I care to admit. But as Pastor Tommy would say, you can feel like quitting as long as you don't quit. Let me say it again and you can repeat it with me. You can feel like quitting, come on, as long as you don't quit. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 5, he would say this. He said, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season, come on class, you will reap if you faint not. That is the King James, but the, uh, another translation would say it like this. If you don't quit, <laughs> turn to your neighbor and tell him, don't quit. The question is not if you are hurt, because if you live long enough, you're going to be hurt. The question is this, if you don't quit. The question this morning is, are you willing to stay in the game? I'm a sports enthusiast, so I like to go to games, watch games, and so forth. And guys, you'll understand this. That is, there's a long history of athletes who we found out later were playing hurt, but yet they stayed in the game, especially in hockey. In hockey, you never let the opposing team know that you are hurt. Someone could be playing, you find out later uh, after the playoffs, you find out they had fractured ribs or they, 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 they had a broke wrist or a broke a finger or toe or something, but yet they battled through it as warriors because they did not want the opposing team to find out that they were hurt. Now listen, mama always said, and mama wasn't the Bible, but she was close to it. Come on, somebody. 
Mama always said, if you think you are hurt, there's always someone worse off than you are. You can always look around and find somebody worse than you are. I remember when Caleb was in the hospital at such a young age, six weeks of age, having uh, skull surgery to remove a large portion of his skull. He was born with an issue called craniostenostosis. And we felt so bad. Our firstborn, six weeks of old, was having to have such a major surgery. It was at All Children's Hospital in St. Petersburg. And I remember walking through that hospital really for the first time. I was a new parent. I also was a fairly new pastor. I think I was two or three years in, and uh, here we were in, in this huge issue in our life, first time, first experience, and of course, we were overwhelmed as parents, Sally and I were, and yet while I walked through that hospital, Caleb's surgery was basically a skull surgery. It wasn't a brain surgery. It was simply taking out a part of his skull and creating a soft spot so that his head would round properly. When I look at his head, we spent a lot of money on that precious head of my son. <laughs> and even though we were overwhelmed with what we were going through, as I walked through the corridors of All Children's Hospital, I realized that there were other parents there going through much worse situations than we were. Their children had brain defects. Their children had cancer. Their babies would not come home with them. And I realized that even though this was the, the biggest issue we had ever faced in our life, there was someone else right there in the same building that was facing far worse issue and circumstances than we were facing. Now that didn't belittle or undermine the feelings that we had. It just put it in perspective. But here's some good news for someone in this room or someone that's watching me today. The same God that can take care of someone Someone else's need he will always take care of your need you've got to make a decision in your life that even though you may be walking through hurt even though you may be walking through pain even though you may be suffering in this life that you stay in the game turn to your neighbor and tell him that stay in the game turn to that other neighbor and tell him that stay in the game there'll be every excuse for you to give up there'll be every excuse for you to throw in the towel somebody didn't treat me right somebody did me wrong somebody cheated on me somebody lied on me somebody hurt me but you've got to make a decision in your spirit that my life will not be dictated by my emotions my circumstances circumstances may change from day to day. Today, I'm on the mountain. Tomorrow, I may be in the valley. Today, I feel good. Tomorrow, I may not feel good. Today, I'm celebrated. Tomorrow, they may talk about me. But in all these things, I will still serve God. He is faithful in my life. I'm going to stay in the game. I tell young preachers, and I was around a few this week, and I remind my young preacher friends that are, that, that are just getting started in the ministry, whether as a pastor or as an evangelist, and people like Pastor Wright and Dr. Martin would say similarly, not every Sunday is going to be a home run. Some Sunday you're going to hit a home run, other Sundays you'll strike out. Some Sundays you're just going to lay an egg and wonder what in the world was I trying to do up there. Someday they're going to celebrate you, and then some days they're going to talk about you at lunch. And you are not in control of most of that. But you have to understand that God is faithful. The Bible says His word will not return unto you void. Some days the choir and the music team, they're going to feel like, man, we were hitting on all four cylinders. And then there's going to be some days it feels like you're just batting up against a wall. People aren't receiving. Technically, it's not going well. It just seems like the songs didn't gel this week. All of those things will go through your mind and you'll feel like giving up. And that's what the enemy wants you to do is to give up, to take a snapshot of your life and say, this is you. This is all you're ever going Going to be. But listen to this preacher today. If the devil's talking, he's lying because Jesus said the truth is not in him. You turn a deaf ear to the devil and let the devil know I'm going to serve God. I shall not be moved like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. Somebody say, stay in the game. 
Have you ever been hurt? Abraham followed God, but he was hurt when his father died. And his nephew took the best land. Moses stayed in the game, even when his people that he was leading, they despised him. They wanted to kill him, and his own brother disappointed him. David stayed in the game, even though his wife mocked him. His son, son hung himself, and his generals plotted against him. Hosea stayed in the game, even though his wife Gomer became a prostitute. Peter denied Christ. Thomas doubted Jesus. Mark went AWOL. They all played hurt, but in the end, what did they do? They stayed in the game. I'm not denying your hurt. I'm not denying your pain today. But you've got to make a decision in your life to, come on class, stay in the game. When Sally and I got married, it was until death do us part. And could I tell you, there have been times that term death do us part has been tested. If you live long enough, there's going to be tests in your life, even in your marriage. I'm reminded of what one old preacher said. He said, Pastor, you talked about how your marriage was made in heaven. He said, remember, so is thunder and lightning also. <laughs> if you live long enough, there are going to be tests in your personal life and in your marriage. But you have to come to a conclusion, and hopefully you did that when you first got married. That, listen, if things don't work out happily ever after, with the white picket fence and the nice house and, and, and a, a little cabin in the corner and, and everything just perfect in your life, I'm still going to serve God. I'm not going to give up. I'm still going to protect the sanctity of my marriage. Some days we have to close the door and go to war. But when we walk outside of these doors, we're still going to be holding hands, still going to be married, still going to be husband and wife until death do us part. I'm going to, come on class, stay in the game. I'm reminded of what one husband was talking about with his wife as he would go see her every single day at the care facility. His wife no longer knew him. His wife would lay there in the bed, look at him on occasion and not know who he was. Ask, who are you and why are you here? And yet every day he would go there and eat with her, <coughs> help her. And she would say, you're such a nice man, but I don't know why you're here. Someone at his church asked him and said, why do you go see her every day? She would never know the difference if you didn't. She doesn't know you. And his response was, you're right, but I know her. He chose to stay in the game. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the next chapter over. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me. Verse 7. The apostle Paul said, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Everybody say a thorn in the flesh. Don't look at your spouse, look at me. Look at your Bible. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. 2 Corinthians verse 8, chapter 12. For this thing I besought the Lord three times. How many times? Three. That it might depart from me. And he, meaning the Lord, said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Say that line with me. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Last line. Come on, read it together with me. For when I am weak, then... Am I strong? Say it again. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, I got hurt. There, there was a messenger of Satan that was sent to buffet me. A thorn in the flesh is what he called it. I like what someone else, in, uh, another writer said, it was like a state or a cleat. If you've ever played ball, especially uh, like baseball, and you're a first baseman, you got to make sure that 
that your, your foot is on the bag, but you want it to be over off the bag so that when the opposing runner runs to first base, that he doesn't step on you. And in professional ball, they wear metal cleats. And it's easy for the first baseman to get spiked. And that's what Paul is referring to, a thorn in the flesh that was sent to buffet me. It was like a spike that was sent in his flesh. Now, this hurt was so great, the apostle Paul does not define exactly what it was. The wound in his life, the hurt, and every one of us has them. They're wounds that typically you cannot see. And yet he says, I prayed that God would deliver me from it. And all he says is this, my grace is sufficient for thee. See, there's some things God removes from your life, but then there are other things that God gives you grace to endure in your life. Are you following me? And Paul prayed, now if anybody could, could get to God, it would be the Apostle Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds of your New Testament. Paul had such a relationship with God. Paul had such a revelation of Jesus in his life that on the road to Damascus, God blinded him naturally so he could see spiritually that which he could not see. God allowed him to see by the Spirit. And it was a dramatic conversion. Nobody knew Jesus like Paul knew Jesus. And yet Paul was hurt. And you mean to tell me that your hurt is so special? Your wound is so big that Jesus could not fix it? That Jesus cannot help you? Well, Pastor Bill, I just cannot get over it. I don't want to minimize your pain or minimize your hurt. But I do want to maximize Jesus and I want to maximize and emphasize the healer of every infirmity and every wound in our life. And no matter how much you've been hurt, that hurt is not too big for Jesus. Well, Pastor Bill, I just can't get over it. You know what you're going to have to learn? You're going to have to learn to allow his grace to be sufficient for you. Some things in our life, we truly never get over it, but we learn to get past it. It's still a part of my life. It happened in my life. I cannot deny it in my life. Some of you may be in this room or watching me, and, and you may have been abused or cheated on or taken advantage of from a, from a prior relationship, but, but maybe you have children from that relationship. Sure to God, you love those babies as much as anything. You cannot deny the history of that relationship. You cannot deny what happened, but yet in the process, God speaks to you and touches you and helps you that even though you may not, quote, get over it, you can get through it and get past it. Understanding that my best days are ahead of me, that God still has a plan for my life. Are you following me? Say amen. amen. He prayed and asked God to heal him, get rid of this thorn in the flesh, this spike, this cleat that he had been spiked with. Not once, not twice, but three times. And every time God says, my grace, G-R-A-C-E, is sufficient for you. Now what is grace? We understand grace gives us what we don't deserve. It's the unmerited favor of God. But really and truly, in this instance, the definition of grace proper would be the sustaining power of God in any given circumstance in your life. That's the grace of God. His grace is sufficient. I don't know what season you're in right now. Maybe it's a season of pain. Maybe it's a season of struggle in whatever area. Emotionally, spiritually, financially, mentally, whatever area it is. And it's a season of pain in your life. You feel like you've been so hurt, so spiked. But yet God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. The sustaining power of God. I love what Bishop Tim Hill says. He says, some seasons or things in life are not near as much for you to conquer as they are for you to endure. I'm going to say that right over here for somebody else in the back. 
There are some things in life that are not so much as for you to overcome or conquer as much as they are for you to endure. In other words, that listen, the mere fact you're still here to tell about it is a testimony because others went through what you went through and they're not here to tell about it. Oh, the devil is a liar. I'm not going to allow the powers of hell to take me out, my family out, my marriage out. I'm not going to allow that. Yes, I may have a limp. I may be wounded. I may be hurt. But I'm still here. Glory to God. And the Bible says here, he speaks and says, my grace is sufficient for you. Well, I just want God to remove it from me. That's not God's plan here. God's plan is not to remove it from you. God's plan is to get you through it, to get you past it, to look at this not as the tombstone of my life, but the stepping stone of my life. Yeah, it happened. If I ever write an autobiography, y'all better look out. I'm going to tell it all. It happened. Stuff happens, but I'm not there anymore. Now listen, there's a theory, and, I, and, and I'll mention this. There's a theory. Some people think that when you give your testimony, you just got to tell it all. No, you don't. Some stuff don't need to be told again. S some stuff happened. It's in your past. Leave it in your past. Quit bringing it up. Not everybody needs to hear all about it. And of course, nowadays we got Google. So first thing we do is Google. We go try to find out information on somebody. I was with a friend of mine the other day and somebody called him and he didn't know. I told him, well, listen, just Google the phone number. You know how it is. You don't answer your phone. Then you wonder, who was that? Curiosity gets you. And so, but I told him, just Google, we, we're in a Google society. You can find out just about anything with people on the internet these days. We've all done it. We've all been there. Searched Instagram, Facebook, social media. But some things need to be left in our past. It's in the arrears. Quit bringing them up. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are, and all things are become let the past be in the past. Don't go fishing in the pond where Jesus has forgiven your sin and buried it. As far as the east is from the west, don't keep bringing it up. Are you following me? Say amen. amen. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. Verse 9, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then later in verse 10, he closes this little lineage or line of, of speaking when he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So what he's saying is, is that when I am weak, that gives God an opportunity to be strong in my life. That when I feel like I've been hurt, I've been spiked, it gives God an opportunity to work big in my life when I am weak. Don't despise being weak. God is not troubled by your weakness. God's not troubled by your feelings. But you got to make sure that you don't allow yourself to be so consumed with them that they, they move you to the point of making decisions that are destructive in your life. Most people, when they act out in weakness, make Bad decisions. When you feel good, you've got plenty of energy, plenty of sleep and rest. You've got a clear mind. You normally will make the right decisions. But it's when you get weak. It's become, when you become vulnerable. It's when you, when you are tired, you're exhausted, your mind's not clear you make the worst decision. That's why most businessmen, if you read any sort of business uh, advice or John Maxwell or Zig Ziglar or any of those gurus who, who try to motivate and encourage businessmen, they will always tell you, make your most important decisions before 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. 
Because by that point, you typically are well rested, you're clear, your mind is clear, and you're ready for the day ahead of you. Make it early in the day when you are still fresh. Because when we are weak, we tend to make bad decisions. Most people don't have affairs in the middle of the day. They know better when the light's on. It's when it gets dark. It's late at night. They're not thinking clearly. They've had a few drinks. And suddenly they're in a mode to where they're thinking differently than they were at 9 o'clock in the morning. There's a big difference between 9 o'clock in the morning and 9 o'clock at night. Come on, you acting like you don't know what I'm talking about. That's all right. Just look forward and amen. But when I am weak, Jesus says, that's when I'll be strong for you. When you are weak, he he says this, that the strength of God, verse 9, is made perfect or complete in weakness. I like what one preacher said. He said it like this. He said, God is drawn to our weakness. Our strength does not impress God. But when we are weak, he is strong. He is drawn, that's what the preacher said, to our weakness. When we have a need of a Savior, he's drawn to us when we are weak. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, stay in the game. Hebrews chapter 4, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. I love this scripture. I preached from it the other Wednesday night. I want to reference it here. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted or tested like as we are without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We're talking about staying in the game here. When you are weak, don't give up, but turn to Jesus. Come on, class, let me say it again. Don't give up, but turn to Jesus. Paul writes here in verse 15 that we have a high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That's my problem. My problem is my feelings. And when I allow my feelings to dictate what I do, that's when I get in trouble. Never be controlled by your feelings. Your feelings are part of your emotions and they will get you in trouble. You, have a three, you are a three-part person. You have a body, soul, and spirit. Your body is the, the outer shell. It's the part you pinch and you hurt. Your spirit is the eternal one. It's the one that will live forever. But your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. It's the the feeling, the touchy, ooey-gooey part of you. And it's the part of you that gets you in trouble. Your feelings. What makes me want to eat a bowl of ice cream at 11 o'clock at night? The feelings. And you can manipulate your feelings based upon your emotions. Let me give you an example. Have you ever watched a movie that you knew was fiction? You knew it wasn't true. It was just a storyline depicted by characters on a screen. Or maybe you were reading the book. But you're watching this movie and you know it's not true and you know it's just a storyline and you know they're just characters. But you have allowed yourself to go someplace by your feelings that suddenly you are now emotionally drawn into the situation. And then you begin to act out. You get scared. You scream in the movie theater. And then think, oh, why did I do that? I'm an idiot. (laughs) Or you get so engrossed in a storyline that a tear starts to come down your cheek. You know it's not true. But yet you've allowed your emotions to become so attached to the story or the plot that you are now responding emotionally. I don't mean to harp on this so much, but that's how affairs get started. 
because you let yourself go someplace. You didn't guard yourself, and you went someplace emotionally that you never should have went, and then you started responding to it. That'll get you in trouble. That's why the Bible says flee from the very appearance of evil. Don't even allow yourself any opportunity to go there. Stay as far away from it as possible. But he says, we have a high preach which, which, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points, somebody say all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So what it tells me is that if there's any place my feelings have gone or will go, Jesus has already been there. Jesus knows. He, he's already been, t- he understands my feelings. Can I tell you, you may be here today and say, nobody understands what I'm going through. Nobody can, t- they don't get me. Can I tell you, your family may not get you. Your spouse may not get you. Your church may not get you. Your friends may not get you. But we have a God who understands and he has been touched by the feelings of your infirmities. And the Bible says he not only understands, but he's been there. Because notice what he says is, but in all points, somebody holler all points. Turn to that neighbor and tell him that's everything. He's been tempted like as we are. He's been there. He's been, think about it, in all points. I know most of us don't like to go there, but every temptation, Jesus has been there. Yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly Unto the throne of what? What kind of throne is it? It's a throne of grace. Now let me tell you, some people don't come to God because they're scared it's going to be a throne of judgment or a throne of condemnation. But if you'll come to Jesus today, you'll come to a throne of grace. And this grace is not just the sustaining power of God. This grace is the unmerited favor of God. This is the grace that gives us what we don't deserve. And I want to tell someone in this room today, you may have a lot of emotional baggage and you may have wanted to throw in the towel and you may have wanted to quit, but if you'll bring that hurt and bring it to Jesus today. Nobody gets me. Jesus gets you. If you'll bring it to Jesus today, could I tell you, Jesus will give you grace, and his grace will be enough. It'll be sufficient for you. Give Jesus a praise today. It's not a throne of judgment. It's not a throne of condemnation, but it's a throne of grace. And what happens when you come to that throne of grace? Notice what the writer says here, Paul. He says that we may obtain mercy. Mercy. Come on, class. You've heard me preach this before. Grace gives us what we don't deserve, but mercy keeps us from what we do deserve. You know, most folks don't like to come to church because they're scared they're going to get judgment and condemnation and not grace and mercy. Well, listen, you've come to the right church today because in these pews, if you can think it, it's probably here. Hopefully all in our past, but it's probably here. Church is full of imperfect people. There are no perfect people in this church, but we worship a perfect God today, and his name is Jesus, but we're not perfect. So you've come to the right church today because we are imperfect people who need the throne of grace who come to obtain mercy. Somebody holler mercy. Grace gives me what I don't deserve, but mercy keeps me from what I do deserve. 20 seconds. Just let me hit this nail right here. Mercy means that I made it somehow, some way, but I shouldn't have. I don't deserve what I have. I don't deserve how God touched me. I don't deserve the family that I have. I don't deserve the money that I have. I don't deserve the physical body that I have. I've wasted my life. I've done bad things. I've really made poor choices, but Somehow, some way, God redeemed my mess and turned me around. That is a product of the mercy of the Lord. You want to know why we get crazy when we sing that song? He picked me up, turned me around, set my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. You want to know why we sing that and go crazy and spin and holler and hoop? And some of you just look, I can't believe they do all that in church. 
Because we know who we are. We know where we've come from. We know our history. My God, I shouldn't even be here today. But somehow, he picked me up. He turned me around. He set my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. I thank God. Woo! Glory to God. That's mercy. And when you come to the throne of grace, you get mercy. God help us. You know, I grew up in churches where if they didn't make you mad, they didn't think you had church. I mean, they felt like they had to preach the hell out of you. And by God, they did everything they could to try to do it. If you want wallering and crying, and listen, there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. Ecclesiastes says there's a time for that. But some people think if you don't feel condemned, you didn't go to church. Well, listen, friend, I didn't come here to condemn you today. I came here to help you today. I came here to lift you up today. I came here to tell you there's a Savior that loves you today. He's got a plan for your life. Other people may have kicked you aside, but God's not finished with you yet. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Let me close this little message. That we may obtain mercy and find grace. Notice, in the time of need are you in need today are you in trouble today did you come here with a burden hurt the preacher came here with a word for you today don't quit stay in the game if you're in need you're in the right spot today come to Jesus he loves needy people I'm a needy pe person I just asked sister Bailey I'm a touchy feeling Come over to her, baby. Hey, how you doing? Come here, baby. I missed you, baby. I missed you too. You know, you can come to Jesus with your need. Last line and we'll be done. When you play through the pain, remember things will get better. You're not going to always feel like this. You're not going to always experience life like this. We serve a God who says, hey, there is hope. This world is not our home. This is an eternity, friends. We're just passing through. Hallelujah to God. And the Bible tells us real quickly, John's Gospel, chapter 20, and we'll be done. John, chapter 20. I was thinking about this story. It's the story of Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas was full of questions. And the, the Bible says in verse 24 that Thomas, one of the twelve, John 20, 24, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. In other words, Thomas wasn't there. And the other disciples said, we have seen the Lord. This is following his resurrection. But Thomas said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hands into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas was with them. Turn to your neighbor and just tell him, Thomas was there. Thomas. Then came Jesus. The doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. In other words, Jesus just appeared. By the way, Jesus doesn't need doors. He is the door. <laughs> Glory to God. And then said he to Thomas, this is Jesus speaking, reach hither with your finger and touch my hands. Thrust it into my side and be not faithless. But believing, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. You know what Thomas needed? He just needed some attention. And can I be honest with you? Jesus specializes with needy people. Sister Bailey's not a needy person. She's pretty self-sufficient. I'm a needy person. I, I like to sit close. 
I like to touch. Sister Bailey doesn't like to touch. You have your side of the bed, I have my side of the bed. You want to snuggle, you want to kiss, etc. But when we go to sleep, you know, get on your side, I get on. It's time to go to sleep. We don't snuggle. But if you're, if you are needy today, Jesus has a place for you. He loves you. Thomas was full of questions. He, he was needy. He needed affirmation. He needed clarification. He needed confirmation. And eight days later, I wonder why Jesus didn't just show up immediately. There's eight days here. Jesus knows Thomas has got questions. I'm not going to believe until I actually put my hands in his hand, until I touch his side where the spear went in. Jesus let him go for eight days. You know what? Some of you right now are in that eight-day period. But then all of a sudden, Jesus just appears. I feel the Lord saying he's about to appear in some people's lives. He's just going to show up. And you know when he showed up, he, didn't, he wasn't announced. They didn't have time to send out a postcard and say, he's coming eight days from now. You better be there. Be ready. No, he just showed up. Could it be glory to God? Boy, I feel his presence. That Jesus is going to show up at somebody's house this week. Jesus is going to show up at somebody's job this week. Jesus is going to show up in somebody's bedroom this week. Just, there he is. And when he came, he looked at Thomas and said, Thomas, here are my hands. Here's my side. Here's everything you need. Whatever you need, Thomas, just come on, Thomas, I'm right here. You got me right now. You got me. Yes, yes, Jesus. Everybody stand to your feet right now. You got a need today? He's everything you need. You got pain and heartache today? He's the pain killer. He is the burden bearer. He is the miracle worker. Whatever you need today, you got to bring that need to Jesus. And when you do, can I submit to you, he's not going to give you judgment, condemnation. He's going to give you mercy and grace to find help in your time of need. Listen closely. I was praying this week and I thought about some of my old time preachers. They'd say, well, sin's got to be punished. Well, you know what? That's right. But thank God for that old rugged cross behind me today. God doesn't punish you for his sin. He punished his own son for his sin. And when you confess Jesus and give it to Jesus, that punishment's taken from off of you and is placed upon the cross that the price was paid for 2,000 years ago once and for all. You don't have to pay the price. Jesus has already paid the price for you. Put it on his account. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Preacher, that sounds too easy. It's grace. It's grace. That's my daddy. My daddy, that, that's his account. He's got an account. All I got to do is say, I'm his son. My daddy paid the price. Just put it on his account today. So how many in this room say, Pastor Bill, I felt like giving up when I walked in this today. I felt like I... I was going to throw in the towel. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of the pain. I'm just going to throw in the towel. You know, there are people who carry pain for years and years. They got wounded over something. Can I just call it? I'm going to call it like it is over here. They got butt hurt over something. I'm not behind the pulpit, religious folks. I came over here. They got butt hurt about something. 
And it may have been legitimate. They may have legitimately got hurt about something, but it's years later they're still carrying that wound, still carrying that bondage, still carrying that hurt. Whoever wounded them has went on, moved on. But the devil's kept them in captivity. Today's the day to tell the devil, you go to hell. My life is too important for me to be living years back there. I'm a new person in Christ Jesus. Let it go. Let it go. What if they get off free? Nobody gets off free. They either come to Jesus or one day they'll face the repercussions of what they've done to you. You may not live long enough to see it, but they'll have to answer to God at some point at some time in their life. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. They'll get their day, but that's between them and God. When you forgive, when you choose to walk in freedom and liberty, you cut the ties, you let it go, and you move on in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to God. Are you following me? Say amen. Bow your heads for just a moment. You're here and you say, Pastor Bailey, you've preached to me. You've talked about me all up in that. You've been living in my house for the last week, the last month. God has spoken to me today. I need to stay in the game. I need to be like Charlie Morton and play through the pain. Not allow it to dictate. That's me, Pastor. That's me. And today, I'm going to stay in this game. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in the towel. If that's you, nobody's looking around, just wave at me right now. Say, preacher, you've preached to me. You've talked to me. God has spoken to me. There are hands everywhere. Hands everywhere. Put your hand up. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Pastor, you've talked to me. God's speaking to me. Heads up, eyes open. If you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, today's the day to bring your life to Him. Today's the day to say yes to Jesus. If you've never trusted Him and you say, Pastor Bill, I'm not ready for eternity. Eternity may be ready for you. And you say, Pastor Bill, I'm not ready for eternity. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. But I want to be. I need to get this right with God today. Today, I need to get it right with God today. I mentioned about the World Series and uh, a friend of mine, friend, might be a strong word, but, but, but he, we've been friendly over the years, a guy I've done business with. And I got the news this week that he was violently killed in a single car crash just this past week. He was leaving the Florida-Georgia football game in Jacksonville, headed to Atlanta to the World Series. He works major sporting events. And somewhere en route in Georgia, he veered off the road. His car crashed. He was killed instantly. I was shocked when I got the news. I had just spoken to him just a few days earlier. That quick eternity may stand at your front door and beckon you. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. It's an appointment every one of us must keep. And if you're not ready for eternity, eternity's not going to wait on you, my friend. God sent the preacher to your life to say today's the day. Get it right. Get it right today. If you say, Pastor Bill, I'm not ready for eternity. I'm not ready for, to, to stand before God, but I want to be. Would you just wave at me right now? Just wave at me. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Pastor, I need to get it right in my life. Today's the day. I'm not going to prolong it. I'm not going to procrastinate. Anybody? How many others in this room, as we had our heads bowed, said, Pastor Bill, you preached to me today. God spoke to me today. Would you just wave your hand back at me one more time? One more time. Just wave it. Just wave it. Everybody look around. Just wave it. Just wave it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stay right there where you're at, but I want every person that you saw somebody near you, would you just stretch your hands towards that person wherever they are? If you're not sure where to stretch them, just stretch them like me, like this in front of you, all around you. We're going to pray for one another right now. Come on, let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, pray with me. Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for ministering to every person today, every wounded person, every hurt person. They're going to stay in the game. They're not going to throw in the towel. 
But today we bring our hurts to you. We bring our pain to you. And thank you, Lord, for being the healer of every wound. Thank you, Lord, for being the healer of every heartbreak. And God, I pray today that in Jesus' name, that, Lord, you'll minister hope and encouragement and strength to every person today. That, God, you would bring encouragement to them. That, Lord, look ahead, look forward in Jesus' name and stay in the game. Come on, class, one more time. Stay in the game. Say it one more time. Stay in the game. Could we give God a praise right there? Sing that, Brian. Sing it. God is able to do Sing it out. just what he said. Everybody put your hands together and give the Lord praise.